from God's Unchanging Word Studios in New Orleans. We are pleased to bring you news, nuggets, and insights with today's host, Tom Carey. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word in another edition for our news, nuggets, and insights. And today is Friday, February 22nd, 2019. Last program for February, two months into the new year already. And we've got, as always, a lot to cover. Today we're going to focus to begin with the Muslim Security Patrol. I don't know if you heard about this, but it's going to follow up on what we've been talking about and warning now for about a year. Then we're going to talk about the Pope again, who's in Morocco this time, and the new Chislam. I don't know if you heard about that. It's pretty serious. Then the Green New Deal follow-up. Got good news for some people who are beef eaters. Interesting stuff. So, and then we're going to follow up with Lying Wonders in the series that we've been working on for the last couple of weeks. But before we begin at all, let's talk about something that's also important to our nation. The national debt tops $22 billion. I'm sorry, that should be trillion dollars, shouldn't it? Trillion dollars. Well, I blew that one. I wish it was $22 billion. $22 trillion. Absolutely amazing with no end in sight. I'm going to show you something here, $22 trillion, and that clock just ticks and ticks and ticks. In this, look what's going on here. The unfunded liabilities is outpacing the actual debt, the yearly debt, by huge amounts, and they call it the GAAP, the G-A-A-P. That means the difference between what comes in that we're agreeing to spend on any given year and the long term. Now, take a look at this. I put this up here for a specific reason. Unfunded liabilities is that is if uh, you agree that you're going to pay somebody's debt or you agree that you're going to finance something. Right now is at $122 trillion. If we were to pay that off right now, because there's no way we can ever pay that off. Obviously, we can't even pay off $22 trillion. Every man, woman, and child, every taxpayer, that is, has to come up with a million dollars. A million dollars per person per taxpayer. In the Green Deal, as we've been hearing about, and I won't go into it today, but they've been talking about, we're just going to take the money from the rich. You've you got to understand something. There's not enough money in the rich to come up with just $22 trillion, much less any of this other money. So anyway, that's where we're at. No end in sight. And you know what else? No one seems to care. Doesn't seem like it makes any difference to anyone unless you're outside the country, who are beginning to get their houses in order to protect when the United States collapses. All right, so now let's get into our news nuggets and insights. And we're going to, the news briefs today, we're going to talk about the Muslims in control on patrol, and then Pope Francis is going to Morocco, and the follow-up on the Green New Deal. So let's begin with Muslim infiltration. We began talking about this last summer. This was a program on Friday, August 17th, 2018, and the focus was cultural changes underway in Europe, talking about the Muslim infiltration and how it began to control and alter the way people actually live in Europe. Now, I put these up. I'm going to bring you up one more, one more from last year. It's going to be two weeks after this one. And the reason I do that is that we don't have enough time to cover all the background of what we're talking about today. So... This way, if you want to go into our programming in the past to do a follow-up, you can simply go to the archives, look up August 17, 2018, and you can watch that program to see how the, the mood and how things change continually progress. And that's the purpose for bringing these back up when we do them. So now, in that program, we talked about a prayer controversy in phases of the Islamic infiltration. The reason I'm bringing that today is because it's worked its way into America very strongly in some states and now into our Congress, and it's also beginning to change communities who change their laws. So this was the phases. First of all was the incubation period. Well, it's just, it's just something we're doing. We want to get along with everybody, and they're coming through. But I go into detail on that in, in March of last, last year. So by all means, go back and take a look at that. Then after recognition, then comes the infiltration. Infiltration is how they actually go into the government and businesses and how they begin to change and to uh, control things. This was an example that we gave. In Birmingham, this was in England, uh, Birmingham's estimated 235,000 Muslims had over 200 city mosques, and they were preparing for 30 days of religious observance. And the rest of the city had to kind of work around them. 
during that entire month. Then, of course, it gets into, like we're beginning to see right now in Congress, the confrontation of their beliefs versus the culture that exists at the time. Then the final one is the imposition is where they begin to move people out of the way and they begin taking over. So now, stages of the control. This was a two weeks later. This was August 31st, 2018. And I've got it circled here. Peaceful Muslim takeover and the stages of the Muslim infiltration. Now, I don't have anything in that program right here, but I want you to be able to go back and take a look at the follow-up. These two programs gave us the foundation of why we understand how things are changing in America and what we were to expect, where they're coming, and some of them are already here now. There's two ways that the Muslim, the Islamic Muslim, and whatever, whatever you want to call them, but it's, it's a Muslim, it's the... Um, a way of life, a culture, and a religion that begins to control and move Christianity out. There's the violence, like you would see with ISIS and many of the other uh, terrorist organizations, and there's also the peaceful. Now, this was decided back in the 50s when Israel became a state, and they were trying to remove Israel. When they couldn't, they decided after a few years that they would go at it two ways, that as long as the earth was here, that, that Muhammad had given them a responsibility. So they take a peaceful way to just gradually change through population and through uh, those stages that we just showed you a few, a few moments ago. Well, that's what's been going on around the world. Europe is in the mess of it all, and now the United States has begun to adopt and to change to bring it here into America. Now, I gave you all of that to bring you this story. Muslims form community control. Some neighbors, neighbors say, no thanks. Well, so what are they doing? This is a self-funded group which sees itself as neighborhood watch, whether there was a lawn, was their cars were spotted in Brooklyn without warning or explanation. So if you began, if you lived in that city and you all of a sudden you would find police cars, they were not police cars, they were literally Muslim patrols. They're going out to protect their people, is what they were saying. So what is that? The Muslim control. All right, so now let's, let's talk about what that really is. The purpose of this patrol is the, it's called the MCPS, which is a civilian patrol organization established to patrol neighbor, neighboring communities in order to protect members of the local community, community from escalating quality of life and nuisance crimes. So what are nuisance crimes? It's just... If you don't agree with them, you, you, you speak out, you stand for what you believe in, quite often that is actually taken as a nuisance crime. So what do you need a patrol for that for? All right, so now, the first 30 members of the all-volunteer Muslim Community Patrol and Services that is preparing to operate in neighborhoods in Brooklyn with a goal of growing its fleet to two cars to five cars by the end of the month, eventually expanding citywide. Now, that's just the basics. That's just for Brooklyn. They've had meetings already for other cities in, in that state and other cities across the country. It's like it's, it's an own civilian army coming, our own civilian police department coming within the community itself. If there is an issue, then it needs to be taken to the, the, the authorities in hand. You don't go out and create your own vigilante group to be able to protect yourselves. So now, this is not a part of becoming a part of the community. This is now isolating itself to take things under their own control. What else happens is it begins to control under a different law, Sharia. That's what's beginning to go on. The group recently held a training that led by off-duty officers of the police department's 72nd district. And this is where it is, the Muslim Community Patrol. And this is a quote in, in, out of the Koran. To save one life is like saving all mankind. And that's, that's the motto that these people are using on their police vehicles. It's like a neighborhood watch, but on steroids, they said. And this was said by Noor Rahab, the group's 31-year-old vice president who lives in Sunset Park. Now, going on, let's suppose now this begins to expand into other communities. What are we looking at? As we showed you from last year, it's going into now these other communities where they have grown in population, where they began to take over in those areas. And this is one example in Michigan. This is in Hamtramck. 
right? It appears to be the first majority Muslim city in the United States following the arrival of thousands of immigrants from Yemen, Bangladesh, and Bosnia over the decade. All right, this is the first majority Muslim city. Now, when I saw this, this picture, by the way, see this picture here? That's in that city. And, and this is the picture that accompanied the article that was online. And, and I'm watching this, this lady here. Now, this is in America, that this is the way the, the, that they're dressing now and bringing in their culture. It just so happened that just a couple weeks ago, we talked about this on the called National Jihad Day, how they wanted all the children to begin to wear little jihabs, or hijabs, I'm sorry, and to, to support the Muslim movement. So now they get everybody to go after them. So in that, I brought out the changes. And I said, you wouldn't be surprised that one day in America you would find them wearing the burqa. Well, here is a form, the burqa. Right, there's your form. You got the niqab and the burqa. So there you add. This is actually right in the middle of those two. This is in the city. Now, this has become normal in their city. You like to know where the women's rights groups are who, prom who are, continue to promote women's freedoms and rights that allow people to have to dress this way in their own culture right here in America. I just wanted to bring that out because when I saw that, I don't know how you feel about that, but it's like, why in the world would we accept that that would be something that people would want to do here in America? Well, one nation under God. But who's God? All right, so now let's go on and begin to wrap this session up. All right. Earlier this month, the Blue Collar City that has been the home to the, the Polish Catholic immigrants and their, descend, their descendants for more than a century became what the demographers think is the first jurisdiction of the national nation to elect a majority Muslim council. So once you begin to control the council, you control the laws and the way people operate. So that's what's going on. And as we showed you last year, that is just like in Europe, it's working its way into America. Well, it's here. And this is some of the examples of what we're talking about right now. And what you will begin to see is that in that community, because you have the majority, things will be brought up to put on the ballots to change the laws and the way things are done in that community. And they will gradually now begin to move out the Constitution and move in. What? Well, it's coming. It's coming. All right, so now let's go on. The Pope, Pope Francis, back in the news. This time he's going to Morocco. This time he's going to Morocco. Now look at this. It's the cross and the crescent. So what is that all about? All right, let's talk about what's coming on now. It says, no such thing as Chrislam, Christianity and Islam are uh, irreconcilable. Actually, there is. Some people say that's not reconcilable. Well, there is. Believe it or not, there really is a religious movement called Chrislam. It began in Nigeria in 1980, or in the 80s, as an attempt to foster peace between Muslims and Christians by blending elements of Islam and Christianity. Now, here's the problem with that. It's two different gods. The very first commandment of the Bible says, Thou shalt be no other gods before me. The second is, is that Islam does not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the Bible tells us that there is no other way. The two cannot be merged. It is impossible to do that. But that's what they're doing, and this is being led by the Pope. It follows, its followers stress the commonalities between the two faiths that they are recognized both the Koran and the Bible as holy text. Unbelievable what we're beginning to see going on. But if there's going to be one world religion, you're going to have to see it being put together. And as we see in Revelation, there will be this the man of sin, and you will find the, the great false prophet, the Holy Roman revival all come together to control the world at the end time. The Vatican releases the program for apostolic journey to Morocco. The Pope will travel to North Africa country at the end of March. On Saturday, the 30th of March, that the Holy Father, and I didn't put that in there, I'm just reading the quotes that comes out there, 
they call themselves the Holy Father, will be received by King Mohammed VI before the meeting of the Moroccan people, the civil authorities and the diplomatic corps reported. During the two-day trip, Pope Francis will meet with the leader of the Moroccan Muslims 800 years after the meeting between St. Francis of Assisi and the Sultan al-Malik al-Kamal of Egypt. And that's the, that is the, the logo that they're using 800 years that they're finally coming back together to talk again. Well, this Pope, since he's gotten into office, has made it his mission to have one world religion. And he's going through his ecumenical movements. He's been here with the United States and brought many of the Protestants back over to uh, Rome to meet with him. And then now he's pulling together a lot of the Muslims to be brought into it. There's also another area that he's bringing into, which I'll show you in just a second. The Catholics susceptible to, to Chrislamism. Chrislamism, now that's got a mouthful to it. In other words, we're part of the Chrislamism movement here. Catholics are highly susceptible to the allure of Chrislamism. Many of them feel that a reconciliation between Islam and the Catholicism is possible. What reconciliation? They never were apart from one another. It is, it is from the Bible at the beginning where God talked about two seeds. Right, the two seeds, we've seen that theme throughout. There's God and there's Satan. There is no unity here. There can never be unity. So there cannot be a reconciliation. There never was. It says they are found in saying that we all worship the same God. What a lie. Absolute, ball face, unequivocal lie. There is not but one God. All right, And they invariably cite the passage in the Catholic Catechism, which says, Together with us, they, the Muslims, adore the one merciful God. I dare say they do not. And that is why you see the persecution that's been going on and on and on. And even to this day where they're wiping out Christianity in the Middle East with every chance they get. So the entire process, the entire thought process is built upon a lie and deception on mankind. So this one world religion, I brought these two pictures in because I wanted to show you what he, when he travels with his plane, whatever plane they written at the time, or leasing, you see one world? That is, that is on the, the, the information and the passages and the paraphernalia that they give out everywhere they go. One world, okay? One world, one religion. And that's what the Pope's been after. So now, how about this one? This is one that you would never think about that the Pope has endorsed and brought into this one world acceptance of their religion. This is called the Global Network of Rainbow Catholics. And there's the Pope at a, at a, at a meeting of the Rainbow Catholics. So now they have not only accepted all religions, they're accepting the Muslims, and they're accepting those who live Laws that God has declared as being so sinful that he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says at the end time that the world would get that way again and he would destroy them one more time. So here we have, we'll see it being brought in. As we know the scripture says, as in the days of Sodom, so shall it be. So we're seeing that beginning to take place in a worldwide acceptance of what God called is as, as heinous and as sinful as you can imagine. So I just wanted to bring that out. I don't know if you knew that or not, but there's actually within the Catholic Church a network of rainbow Catholics. I mean, this stuff just, I don't know, it just seems to move so fast you can't keep up with it in the news, even in News Nuggets and Insights, we do it every single week. But there's more and more being brought out, and we thank God that He helps lead us to these stories to be able to share them with you. So now let's go to something a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter here. The future of America. We talked about this last week. This is with uh, Acacia Cortez proposal of the Green New Deal. You know, we talked about that last week with a lot of, a lot of humor. And, and of course, in the country, there's been a lot of sarcastic humor across the country. And that was last week. Then this week, of course, with her comments, his ran out. Uh, Amazon, 25,000 jobs going into New York. Of course, they didn't like what she said and some of the others. So Amazon says, okay, we're taking our toys. We're going somewhere else. 
loss of 25,000 high paying jobs in New York. Unbelievable. This entire segment here is an absolute nightmare. And it shows what God talked about, about losing the wisdom of going forward. But I brought it out today. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. It talked about with the, with the doing away with the cows passing gas. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you enjoy this. I just want all the beef eaters to rest assured we have found a scripture that they're not going to get away with this. All right, so this was a couple of the cartoons I used last week, and it said on this side here, climate change suspect, but the cow, well, they're talking about we've got to get rid of all the emissions and gas because of these cows will never be cured until we get rid of all, every one of the cows. So, so one of their candidates is running on a vegan platform now. Of course, and this one over here is the methane gas reduction plan. The methane gas reduction plan. And as I was saying last week, I think there's a market now for gas X for cows. Gas X for cows. So now how about this? All right. So now this is our little nugget segment. This ought to make everybody really happy except for the cows. So this is found in Zechariah 14. In Zechariah 14, it's talking about the return of Jesus Christ and people coming together for the Feast of Tabernacles. And now we're going to worship Christ in Jerusalem. Well, look what we find when Christ returns and he comes back. It says, such also shall be the plague on the horse and on the mule and on the camel and on the donkey and on all the cattle that will be in those camps. So there we have it. For all you beef eaters, we're safe. At the return of Jesus Christ, we still have cattle. And that's our nuggets for that segment this time. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Can't help it. Sometimes you just got to bring this kind of stuff out there. All right. So this is what God says on a little more serious note. OK. All right. So now going into this, her program, the entire program was built about going green, getting rid of planes, getting rid of all these combustible engines, anything that used the use uh, oil and coal and everything else, because we got to get rid of it all. So that means we're going to use like this high-speed rail train system. Well, just to run in the cities of California, this project overran from 40 to $77 billion, and they had to kill almost the entire project because they couldn't afford it. Now try to imagine putting this in the rest of the country. And they've been at it for, I think it was like 13 years, 13 years. All right, so the delays in the project ran for 12 years, and it will be over 25 years and longer to complete. That's one rail system. Think about it. This program is telling them we're going to re retrofit every single building in America. If we can't retrofit it to where it's, it's going to be greenhouse friendly, we're going to tear it down and build a new building. I mean, you, you just can't imagine the cost factors for all of this. There's no way that this is going to work. So, what is, so what's going on here? This is, this is the governor of California. By the way, he hates the administration that's out there who promotes the green stuff, all right? Let's be real, the governor Newsom said. The current project is planned would cost too much and respectfully take too long. There's been too little oversight and not enough transparency. So when you look at all this stuff, that's just one project. All right, so, so now let's, let's put this in perspective. While the green program comes out and says all the things are going to change in 10 years now, by the way, just 10 years, the reality of a project that's already been in the works, this, this high-speed train that's going to run green-friendly, the reality is they can't even afford to do that, much less run them anywhere else in the country. The governor says this. Let's be real, said Governor Newsom. The current project as planned would cost too much and respectfully take too long. There's been too little oversight and not enough transparency. So that's just one. That's just one of the projects. $77 billion just to run to nine cities closely related in California. Try to imagine the builders across the country and over the mountains. This is beyond anyone's belief. So now, what does God say about all of this? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, 
and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The word prudent that the Bible uses here means is a lack of wisdom and understanding going forward. So when you look at this and the program comes out and 62 representatives and senators sign on saying we're, we, we're in support of this, you realize what God's saying is that there is no sanity in government at this particular time. All right, that's it for our program at the beginning. We're going to come back in just a few minutes for our Nuggets portion. We've got an interesting set of, uh, of uh, slides that we're going to be talking about with lying wonders, with deception and lying wonders. But before we go to that, we got a video here for President's Day. This is from Prague U on George Washington. Take a look at this little video, and we'll be right back. It's hard to imagine there would have been a United States of America without George Washington. He was there at the birth of the nation. He successfully guided it through war and nurtured it in peace. How did he do it? Not by being a great general, a potent political theorist, or even a clever politician. He was none of those things. And yet he was admired by generals, political theorists, and politicians. Why? Because he was a man great men trusted. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, and so many others looked up to him. Literally, he was one of the tallest men of his era at six feet three. Add courage, integrity, and wisdom, and you have a truly impressive figure. Let's start with his courage. That was never in doubt. If anything, he had too much of it. Bold to the point of rashness as a young man, he fought for the British against the French over control of the Ohio Valley, then the westernmost point of the American wilderness. Throughout that conflict, known as the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, Washington was always in the thick of the action. His aides often struggled to keep him from surging too far ahead of his own troops. In one battle, his coat was pierced four times by musket fire. Horses were shot out from under him. Amazingly, some would say miraculously, he was never wounded, not so much as a flesh wound. By the time the revolution broke out in April of 1775, Washington was firmly committed to the cause of American independence. He arrived in Philadelphia in May of that year to offer his services to the Continental Congress. He was quickly made commander of the new rebel army. There was only one problem. There was no army to speak of. There was just a ragtag collection of state militias. How was Washington going to defeat the greatest military force in the world with that? It was a problem the general struggled with for eight and a half years. That he managed to hold the army together, organize it into a disciplined fighting force, and guide it to victory was testament to his fortitude, his patience, and his personal bravery. Of his integrity, one need only look at what he did when the war ended exactly what he had promised to do when the war began. He resigned his military command and went home to Mount Vernon. By stepping down, Washington raised himself up as the embodiment of Republican heroism. It is said that King George III asked the London-based American painter, Benjamin West, what Washington was likely to do when peace came. West replied that Washington would probably return to his farm. The king was astounded. If he does that, his majesty declared, he will be the greatest man in the world. This story may be apocryphal, but the Newburgh Rebellion and how Washington handled it is not. With experience had come wisdom. As the revolution wound down, a group of officers refused to give up their arms until they were paid. If they didn't get their money, which Congress didn't have, they would take control of the government. It was not an idle threat, no less a figure that Alexander Hamilton was in a panic. Washington, no great orator, sought to diffuse their anger. They had risked everything to create a Republican society, he told the officers. To abandon the cause now, when true victory was so close, would mean all their sacrifices would have been in vain. However convincing the speech may have been, it was a simple gesture that carried the day. He concluded his remarks by reading to them a letter sent to him from a member of Congress. Suddenly he stopped. 
From his pocket, he pulled a pair of spectacles. None of the officers had ever seen him wear them. Putting the glasses on, Washington said, Gentlemen, you must pardon me. I have grown gray in the service of my country and now find myself going blind. He finished reading the letter and left the hall without another word. The gesture, sincerely offered with just the right touch of stagecraft, pierced the hearts of his men. Many were moved to tears. They immediately passed a resolution declaring their loyalty to civilian government. George Washington had saved the revolution once again. It wouldn't be the last time. During the writing of the Constitution and during his eight years as president, Washington was repeatedly called upon to hold the fractious young nation together. He never failed to do so. We commonly refer to George Washington now as the father of our country. It's hard to imagine any nation ever had a better one. I'm John Roadhamel, author of George Washington, The Wonder of the Age, for Prager University. Welcome back. It's, it's amazing when you look at the character of the individuals that God brought to the forefront that had, had established our nation. It's so similar to when God began his church with the character that God used to bring into being the church that would exist until Jesus Christ returns. It's amazing when you look at those type of characters. God didn't use the, the most wise of any of the, of the people of the day. He used those with the character and gave them the wisdom to be able to handle the job to bring about one nation under God. And today we're blessed by that as we're watching many people in this, this nation just try to tear it down and destroy it as we brought out with the, with the section on Islam. So now let's go back into our session now that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. Now, I want to tell you, we've, we've been working a part of it here and part of it in a sermon series that I'm doing. All right, so we're taking various aspects of lying wonders and we're pulling pieces together to be able to look at it from the Bible through different, uh, different ways and means that God shows us about the lying wonders. So today we're going to pick up some of what we had before to give you a quick review. In Acts 20, 28 through 30, we talk about that God warned, this is through Paul, to, to, in the book of Acts, he said that when he left, that grievous wolves would come in. And we're talking about the church and how, how people will come in to try to wreck what God has established. Verse 30 is the most important point of this verse from what I'm looking at. He says, also from among yourselves, men will rise up. The people that you've sat with and worshiped with and been a part of in the church will all of a sudden rise up begin to speak perverse things. In other words, they will have their mind so deceived that they'll begin to look at, at, at uh, truth and throw it away and speak evil of, as the Bible says, to draw away disciples after themselves. Now look at 31. He says, Now watch therefore and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And that is why this one verse here is one of the reasons why I'm working in this series from all these different angles because there's so much deception that's going on around the world. And I showed you a little bit of that with the Pope and how even bringing in the Rainbow Coalition. Well, you know, younger people today and people in school and colleges, they don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, they think the way we believe who have maintained the integrity of the scriptures that we're wrong. All right. So the whole thing has been turned upside down. As they say down here for uh, Mardi Gras, topsy-turvy day. Well, this is a topsy-turvy religion that's been going on now in the rest of the world. Hosea says, my people are destroyed for not lack of knowledge. This is a warning that God gives us. He says, you reject knowledge? He says, I'll reject you. Second Thessalonians, he says, that the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So at some point, all the foundations of what's going on right now for all this perverseness that, that God is going to allow. Are you ready? He's going to allow Satan, a man of sin, and, and this incredible evil power to come on to, to begin to bring in lying wonders. In other words, they're going to be able to like call down fire from heaven. They may be able to give a dead person back to life. Who knows what's going to happen? But they're going to be lying wonders and they're going to deceive everyone in so much that it's possible to even deceive the very elect. 
and he will do it with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So the key is they have to have the love of the truth. So now that is so important. I want to bring this out one more time. I brought it out last week and I brought it out in part one of my sermon. This is what where you can go to our church website to find our beliefs. And everybody needs to understand this. You can be founded in the truth. It's amazing that over the years and all through all the splits that I've been in with the different churches, the one thing that's never changed is a statement of beliefs. It's how you operate has changed, who's in charge has changed, names have changed, but what we've believed has never changed. So now, if you go to the website, now here's the website, this is the main page. You go to www.thecogmi, thecogmi.org. You go to this page. So when you go to that page right here, there's a little box that when you click on it, it'll have a drop-down box that says about us. On that box right there, about third line down, is what's called the statement of beliefs. Simply click on that statement of beliefs and this page will open up to you. That page is our statement of beliefs. You can print it out. If you don't have the capability of printing out, if you'd like to, just call us up or write in and we'll send you a copy. It's a list of 26 doctrinal points of what we actually believe. I recommend highly that you get this, this document, go through every single scripture, right, and, and document what's going on there and firmly affix in your mind. So when someone brings in a doctrine that has no bearing upon truth, you can immediately reject that when, when it comes in. So now, so what are we issuing? Last week we talked about the fringe issues and we talked about the holy days. All right, so I talked about this at length in the sermon. I'm not going to spend as much time here, but I need to discuss a little bit about this. It's usually not the doctrines that get, that get the, uh, destroyed. It's usually eaten away little by little from fringe issues, for example, like the holy days. All right, so the holy days, people who are not in the church, it's real simple for them. They were fulfilled, they're no longer to be kept. All right, that's easy for us inside the church who have been understanding the truth to realize why they think that and why it's wrong. No deception here. But from within, now you've got a problem. So just like we read when Paul warned them in the book of Acts chapter 20, they're going to rise up from among you. So we're to keep them, all right? The conflict is in the fringes on how do we keep them? All right, so you think, okay, we're supposed to keep them, but how do we keep them? Then you bring in the fringe issues that begin to separate and divide the church. All of a sudden, calendars are now involved. You know, which calendar do you use? How do you observe a calendar? New moons, how do you observe a new moon? Do you keep the new moon on a crescent? Do you keep it in the dark, the conjunction? Do you, you keep it on a 16th crescent, 32nd, an eighth? So you got all these things that goes on, and who has the authority to be able to do all these things? So, so that's why today in the Church of God community, you will find that people keep the holy days all kinds of different days, all kinds of different days. So the assault and the truth has actually come from within through the fringe issues. All right, so here, I brought in a, a, a slide that was used last week. The goal is, says that there be no divisions among you. All right, so across the, across the globe, there's divisions everywhere. And that the person who sows discord, that God says is one of the things that he hates. All right, so now, so the goal here is to maintain unity and not sow discord among the brethren. So how do we do that when we keep the holy days? All right, let's get to the foundation. Leviticus 23. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right, so this is the very first holy days. These are the spring holy days, which are kept on the first month of the Hebrew New Year. And we know that the days of unleavened bread are seven days. The very first one is kept a holy day on the 15th day of the month. We know that from the calendar, from God's calendar, either 29 points, so many hours to 30 days is with is the middle of the month is on the 15th. So obviously from the middle of the month, you're at a full moon. All right. So that's obvious. You ever notice that when you, when you go keep the Feast of Tabernacles, or you have Passover and then you get together on on the uh, uh, first holy day, the next night, and you go out and there's always a big, bright, full moon that's out there? Well, that's because God has prescribed it to be that way. All right, Leviticus 23, verse 24. 
speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month on the first day of the month. All right, this is the day that is called the Feast of Trumpets, picturing the return of Jesus Christ. All right? Then a little bit further, it's in Leviticus 23, 34. On the 15th day of the seventh month, and for the seventh days, is the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, it's the 15th day. So what God has done, and I've got, got a slide coming up in just a, sh a second to show you what He's done. 15th day, first month. 15th day, seventh month. Those are the two holy days series. The, the, there's, three, there's three seasons. There's the, the early season, which is the Passover, Unleavened Bread. Then you have Feast of Pentecost. And then you have the end season, which concludes with the Feast of Tabernacles. So now, here's the problem. You cannot find anywhere in the Bible that tells you how to calculate the first day of each new month. So all the arguments, you know, when I, when I, when I put it down and I tried to isolate where are we coming from, why are so many problems, the problem is every argument you hear, depending on the crescents, the darkness, the uh, postponements, and who has the right to hell out and this calendar and calculate it, all these calculations and everything that's out there, they have no bearing in Bible. Everyone is built upon historical records of who did what and how. You need to understand that because here's what you're doing. Is you're taking the Bible and it's no longer your authority on when you keep the holy days if you follow the new moon scenarios that are being given to us today. Do you realize that? Why? Because in the Bible, there's nothing to tell you how to calculate them. Not one thing. And I found what was interesting about this entire thing is that, you know, Jesus Christ, when he was talking to the Pharisees and when he talked to his disciples, he never had to go outside the scriptures to make his point. If you remove this Bible and go into history, you have just removed the only authority that you have on which to operate. But that's what people are doing today. And that's how people get deceived. The problem is there's nothing in the Bible to tell you how to do that. But God did. And it's being rejected. All right, so now, thus, today there's literally dozens of people and organizations who have taken upon themselves to be the authority on how to calculate. Thus, there are numerous calendars and times today for the holy days. So who do you believe? See, that's the problem here, is that when you take your authority outside the Bible, you have to trust a man who's supposed to be right. And the trouble is you build every one of your arguments on something that has nothing, there's no bearing in the scripture to support the argument or its answer. That's the crazy thing about this, this issue here with the holy days. So let's go on and show you what I'm talking about. On every occasion when he was confronted or challenged, talking about Jesus Christ and his example, what did he do? He always referred back to the scriptures. And, and in one point he says, what do the scriptures say? Remember when he was tempted by Satan? What did he do? He quoted scripture. Satan would quote him scripture and Christ would repeat back a scripture with him. In Romans 3, 1 through 2, this is the only authority you have for the holy days on the timing when they're to be kept. And people have rejected this scripture for the New Testament in Romans. What advantage then has the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, he says, but chiefly or primarily because to them was given the oracles of God. So now, you can argue to your blue in the face all your points about the Jews. There's different sets of Jews. They, they, were, they were captured in Babylon. They came back and has been corrupted. But none of that has any bearing to Scripture. The Scripture, you, you, here you have, to, you have to agree to this or not agree to this. Is the Bible the authority or not? If the Bible is the authority, then you have to follow this scripture. And the problem, the reason you have all these problems today is because it has rejected that Roman scripture. Because they, people today say that the, the Jews today have no authority for what they're doing. So when you do that, the Bible's out, history's in. And history is filled with rewrites and lies. So going on, all right, so let's go on. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now, the Jews have something that nobody else has. They have two witnesses, all right? They have the Word of God, and they also have 
the moon, which is the authority. Look what God says. Once I have sworn by my holy, holiness that I will not lie to David, or his seed shall endure forever his throne as the sun before me, it shall be established forever as the moon, as a faithful witness in heaven. So here we have the Jews. Arguments you want to, all the arguments you want to bring out. Every year on the holy days, those bookends that I was telling you about, the full moon is on the 15th. So whether you can say it's right or wrong, or they, got, they calculated it wrong, they got the postponements that nobody has any authority, none of the arguments can be balanced because there's nothing in the scripture they're arguing against. They're arguing against man-made uh, uh, decisions of what has to be done by history. But the Jews have two things. God says his word is established by two things. One, Romans 3. Second is the moon. And God says it's a faithful witness. So in other words, God wouldn't trust any man to maintain those holy days. He has, and he's done it through his moon. We don't have a priesthood anymore. So the way they actually did it back in the Old Testament, we only have fractions of pieces of information. We try to put it together through history. And God knew that would happen. So he is the high priest, and he has set things in order for which we are to follow. The two witnesses, Hebrew, Psalm 89, we just read. Uh, he says, he was sworn by his holiness, but the moon be established. And also by Revelation chapter 12. All right, here's another documentation. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and her head with a crown of 12 stars. Let's talk about that for just a second. I was talking to one of the members here in New Orleans about this and that we ought to go back into some of the balance of why we looked at these stars because there's a lot of people today who are in the church who weren't here four years ago. And the church had always taught that you don't look at stars because that's pagan. That's, that's evil. That's corrupted. But the trouble is, that's what God says from the very beginning in Genesis. He said he put those in the heavens as signs and for seasons. You know, so, so those are for us for signs. But Satan has corrupted what God did and tell us, don't look at that. So what I'm going to do in, in, in part two on this lying wonders is I'm going to begin and go back and, and just take a segment of that and establish why it is biblical to look at the stars. What's not biblical is to use them for your horoscopes and to make a religion out of it. So we'll talk about that uh, my, on my next sermon in about a week. All right, so now it says, And being with child, she cried, travail in birth, and being pain, she delivered. So now, here's the bookends. We did this to come out of a slide from 2015. We were talking about the blood moon tetrads. I know many people in the churches of God said, all of that's nonsense, it means nothing. Well, it does mean something. God says he put these things in the heavens as, as signs. It didn't mean what the world was trying to say. It wasn't the end of the world, the return of Jesus Christ. But Joel says that these will be signs before the day of the Lord. So now, but that, we'll talk about that later. What I want to talk about here is the bookends in the moon as the witness. All right, so you had the first day of unleavened bread, which is the 15th we just read, and the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which also is the 15th day of the month. So you had the 15th day of the first month, 15th day of the seventh month, and on each one of those occasions for those holy days, you have a full moon which shows that the Jews have accurately calculated when that time period is because it's a full moon. It's very simple. Today, you know when the full moon is through NASA. They've got to calculate precisely to the moment because they understand the engineering dynamics of what God set in place from creation. That's why Romans, I mean, Revelation 12 is so important that God could put it out there because all of these orbits and everything that took place was calculated in God's plan. So now, let's take a look at these two witnesses, okay? We just read those two. I must have this in there twice, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this up, and let's get to where I want to be at now. All right, here we go. All right, so this was a sign of the Virgo. This, is, this was big news back in September 23, 2017, and people honestly thought Christ was coming back at that time. It was a world that was in a mess at the particular time. So what are we looking at here? So I'm going to go briefly through this. We've covered it before, so I'm going to go through this to show you what God set in, in motion from creation. Revelation 12. 
there appeared a great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. All right, so what are we looking at here? This is the, this is the Virgo. This is the time period. This is, um, uh, you can actually go back and you can do this through you, the calculations with the software. Wow, and I can't think of the name of that software right now. Um, but we'll, I'll find it for you and get that, get that to you. But she's clothed with the sun. See, it's the, the sun on her shoulder. So what we're looking at is, is a sign from God before the day of the Lord. Also, with the moon is at her feet. So underneath her feet, way down at the bottom, you see the box, there's the moon under her feet. And on her head was a garland of 12 stars. All right, these are the stars in Leo, that's uh, what's like the crown for her. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you come to nine, which is Venus. These are called the roving stars because they, they're constantly moving. The other stars continually to stay in Leo. But you have three who move. Nine, you have Venus, Mars, and Mercury. All right, so now you have 12. You have the 12, uh, you have the 12 stars, which is on the crown, on her head. Then being with child, she cried in labor pain. So what are we looking at with child? The little box that I brought out just there is the womb area of Virgo, the virgin. And right there you see Jupiter. And so when I run it through, I'm going to show you this little video that runs for about two minutes, and I'll narrate it. You see that Jupiter, which is the king planet, all right, the king planet is being delivered, comes out. It's in the womb period right up in here that stays in there for about nine months. Absolutely amazing. It's the only time in history that NASA can find that this alignment actually takes place. All right, so now this is a video that's running right now. So when you, when you, when you let's just pull it up, uh, let's run that video. So there you see Jupiter. You see Jupiter is on the outside of, uh, of the womb area. So you see my cursor. I'm using my cursor to show us where we're at. All right, so this is October 30th, 2016. So I'm showing you just before everything begins to move. Now I click on it and you can see the sun moving, the Jupiter's moving. It's going to 11, 14, 15, all right, 18. I stop it. You see Jupiter now is about to go inside the womb area in this particular area. See, this is, I keep moving. See the moon coming through? Now we're at 11, 23. I keep moving it. All right, so I'm just showing you again. Jupiter's going in. I click on it again, see the moon moving. So now I'm running it. So I'm just going to run it now. It's going to go for about nine months. And every time you see that moon running through there, another month has passed by. So now we're in uh, February. I'm running now in March. And, and it just keeps continually rolling, running through April. You see Jupiter going back and forth inside the womb. It almost comes out and gets right to the edge through what's called retrograde, turns around and begins moving back again into the side of the womb. And it stays in this particular area. All right, now we're in July. All right, August. Now we're moving to August. I slowed it down. So things are beginning to line up. Here we come, see things moving through. Now you're in September. You see the sun's about to come to her shoulder. All the things are lining up. This is, uh, this is September 9th. See where Jupiter's at? It's just about to make its way outside the womb area. Remember, we started this way back in November. So now this is 9, 10, 11, 9, 11. See, now we're moving things through. All right, so I'm clicking again day by day. See all the planets now rolling into place. Now look at the moon. See the moon right there? When just a couple more days, when we stop it, it will be at our feet. All the planets will be in the alignment. These are literal orbits that, that NASA follows that you can find yourself when you go online. All right, so here we have the planets all in place on 923. All right, sun's on her shoulders. She's closed in the sun. And Jupiter now is outside the womb. As the, as the Revelation 12 says, and there's the moon at her feet. Or actually, it says under her feet, and it's literally under her feet from the... Uh, from the, the description. All right, so now I click the, I'm just going forward, and the orbits and all the information continues in place as it always has since creation. So what are we looking at here? This is amazing. This is an amazing thing that God has given to us. So now, this alignment, and, and I talk more about that in part one, so you want to get the sermon 
on line one, there's deception line one, just because I go in a lot more detail into it. And you can go online. Or you can go online and where we talked about out of the mouth of two witnesses. It's a two-part sermon, which is even more detail that we went back into four years ago. That alignment we were looking at took, takes place basically four times. The two times here is one is that the fall of the temple in the Old Testament, 586 B.C., and 70 A.D. The big difference here, the big, big difference is there's nothing in the womb areas. All right, so nothing's being delivered. So this is showing destruction that's taking place with the woman. The other occasion that has taken place is in 3 B.C. When you look at 3 B.C., it's incredible because the sun now is in the womb area where it wasn't before, anywhere near it. And then the one we just went through is Pluto. Pluto is in the area. What's absolutely amazing about these, these alignments that God has put into place here is this. You have the two alignments at the fall of the temple, showing of the woman, or the church, or whatever you want to call that, in the alignment with the 12 crowns at her head and clothed in the sun. Then you have the two alignments of Jesus' coming. He had the first coming, which was 3 B.C., and what you see is the sun in the womb, which aligns itself to the Scriptures. In Matthew 4, 16, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. There is no greater light for our planet system than the sun, all right? Sat in great light, and to them which sat in the region, the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So here you have the alignment, and you can actually pinpoint the time of Christ's birth in the September period, all right? You can do that, 3 B.C., and, uh, and you'll see the sun, they sat in darkness, saw a great light. Then you have in the, the New Testament, I mean, in the, the later here, is Pluto in the womb when Jesus is coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Look at Revelation 19:16. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So here you have the sun with the brightness of his being coming the first time. People sat in darkness, saw a great light. This time he's coming back as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And Pluto is actually, I mean, Jupiter is named as, I do that all the time. I keep calling it Pluto. I don't know why that. It's actually Jupiter. It's actually Jupiter. Uh, I hope one of these days I'm going to get that correct. But I've done that for four years now. But anyway, Jupiter is the king planet. So he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. So now, we're going to be offering this sermon. It's part one and part two on the, the sermon for deception and lying wonders. We covered in detail what I just went through kind of quickly right there. Part two, we're going to talk about how it infiltrates the church and being dis deceived from those who are actually not in the church. You would think you can't be deceived, but I'm going to show you. You can, and it's really simple how that takes place. All right, let's get to from the home office today. So from the home office, we have, uh, oh, that's right, just two more weeks. Our dedication down in Daytona Beach. We'll be dedicating the new building. I just saw some pictures uh, Chuck Baker has sent to me. From the outside, it looks really, really nice. The way they've got it all uh, spruced up and looking really good. They're holding back the inside. They want to surprise everybody, so see how nice it's come along. But if you're anywhere in the area that you can get down there to visit, by all means, you can get in touch with uh, Chuck Baker, and there's his number and his email address. Or you can get in touch with Mo and Gene Dion. There's their phone number and their email address. Uh, next week, what I'll do is I'm going to put a little schedule up because we're going to have a, a get-together on Friday night, and then we're going to be having a couple of workshops on Saturday morning, uh, lunch and then services and they'll have a fellowship and an evening of, uh, of uh, just fun activities while we're down there. So hopefully you can join us and be a part of this dedication for the Daytona Beach for the Church of God in Daytona Beach, Church of God Ministries International. So in the mail last week, a sermon, No Place for Repentance, that I gave and out, Get Out of the Way by Chuck Hunt Jr. All right, so let's uh, back this up. All right, so now, let's begin to wrap our program up. And as always, we uh, want to use an uplifting video. This is a fun little video. You got you to pay close attention because it goes really fast. The kids are going to love this. And I got to tell you, it was made a few years ago. So it actually stops at Bill and Hillary Clinton. It doesn't have anybody after that. But it's still a worthwhile video. It only runs about three minutes. And you're going to really like this. All right, let's play that video, and I'll be right back to close the program.
do you know? The names of the U.S. residents who then became the presidents and got a view from the White House Lou of Pennsylvania Avenue. George Washington was the first you see. He once chopped down a cherry tree. President number two would be John Adams and then number three. Tom Jefferson stayed up to write a declaration late at night. So he and his wife had a great big fight and she made him sleep on the couch all night. James Madison never had a son, then he fought the War of 1812. James Monroe's colossal nose was bigger than Pinocchio. John Quincy Adams was number six, and it's Andrew Jackson's butt he kicks. So Jackson learns to play politics next time. He's the one that the country picks. Martin Van Buren, number eight, for a one-term shot as chief of state. William Harrison, how do you praise that guy was dead in 30 days? John Tyler, he liked country folk. And after him came President Polk. Zachary Taylor liked to smoke. His breath killed friends whenever he spoke. 1850, really nifty, Miller Fillmore's in. Young and fierce was Franklin Pierce, the man without a chin. Follows next up, period spanning. Four long years with James Buchanan. Then the South starts shooting cannon. And we got a civil war. A war, a war down south in Dixie. Up to bat comes old Abe Lincoln. There's a guy who's really thinking. Kept the United States from shrinking. Saved the ship of state from sinking. Andrew Johnson's next. He had some slight defects. Congress each would impeach. And so the country now elects. Ulysses Simpson Grant, who would scream and rave and rant. While drinking whiskey, oh, the risky, cause he'd spill it on his pants. It's 1877 and the Democrats would gloat. But they're all amazed when Rutherford Hayes wins by just one vote. James Garfield, someone really hated cause he was assassinated. Chester Arthur gets instated, four years later he was traded. Lord Grover Cleveland, really fat, elected twice as a Democrat. Then Benjamin Harrison, after that, it's William McKinley up the bat. Teddy Roosevelt charged up San Juan Hill. And President Taft, he got the bill. In 1913, Woodrow Wilson takes us into World War I. Warren Harding next in line. It's Calvin Coolidge, he does fine. And then in 1929, the market crashes and we fight. It's Herbert Hoover's big debut, he gets the blame and loses too. Franklin Roosevelt, president who helped us win in World War II. Harry Truman, weird little human, serves two terms and when he's done. It's Eisenhower who's got the power from 53 to 61. John Kennedy had Camelot, then Lyndon Johnson took his spot. Richard Nixon, he gets caught and Gerald Ford fell down a lot. <laughs> Jimmy Carter liked camping trips. And Ronald Reagan's speech and scripts all came from famous movie clips. And President Bush said, read my lips. Now in Washington, D.C. There's Democrats and the GOP. But the ones in charge are plain to see. The Clintons, Bill and Hillary. The next president to lead the way. Well, it just might be yourself one day. Then the press will distort everything you say. So jump in your plane and fly away. Well, I hope you like that. And I tell you, the end says so the next one comes in and the press will distort everything you say. Well, that's still true. <laughs> that's still true. Well, that's it for our program for news, nuggets, and insights for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Hope you have a great week. And from all of us here at God's Unchanging Word, thanks for watching and being a part of our program. Be sure to share this with everybody you know. They will love you for it or not. God bless you. Till next week.